If somebody asked me to sum up in a sentence my stay in Fredonia, it was the best of times and it was the best of times. <laughs> to, to, to steal something from Dickens and change it a little bit. Yeah. It was the best of time for me professionally. I grew a lot here. And it was the best of times for me personally. My son was born here. And friends I still have were here at the time. Uh, nothing to do with the arts, just town. Yeah. They're no longer in town. One's a vice president of the yeah. Federal Reserve. Wow. Well, he's retired now. He taught math here. Uh -huh. And so, yeah, it was, it was a great time for me. And, but I wanted the experience of building performing arts centers. Uh -huh. And I was given that chance in Tulsa. And it didn't hurt that they also more than doubled my pay to go uh -huh. do it. That yeah, didn't hurt. Right. But that's not why I took I wanted to take something and, and, and do it from as close to scratch as possible. And then I did two others that were mm -hmm. prior to hiring the architect. Mm -hmm. And, I, and then I did a convention center, oh. the last building ever designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, who lived outside of Madison and went to school in Madison, but flunked out in a year and a half. Uh, he had designed in 1939 the Monona Terrace Civic Building, which was to be a courthouse, jails, you know, some ceremonial spaces on the lake, built over the lake. Lake Monona. In 1959, he redesigned it. The taxpayers turned it down. In 1959, he redesigned the inside to be a performing arts center and museum. Hmm. They floated a bond issue. They raised the money from the bonds. However, the bond money wasn't enough, and they shelved the project, but the money stayed invested. In the late 1980s, Paul Soglin, who had been mayor in the 60s, was back as mayor again. As a matter of fact, he just left for his third time. He served three 12-year periods as mayor. He's never had a real job. Uh, and he wouldn't like it if I said that, <laughs> but he knows it. Uh, he resurrected the idea of Monona Terrace. And the money that... In the meantime, the civic, city had built a civic center out of an old movie theater and a Montgomery Ward store. They bought it, and they spent, I don't know, five or six, seven or eight million dollars renovating this space with the name architect, you Hardy, yeah. from Hardy Holzman and Pfeiffer. Malcolm Holzman, I'm sorry, Malcolm Holzman from Hardy Holzman and Pfeiffer. And I was brought into town to get the convention center built and to, inside of the Frank Lloyd Wright design, to convert it to a convention center. And to uh, run the Civic Center. And the Civic Center was my full-time job, but I spent more time working on the Convention Center. And I basically started sketching things of how you could lay it out in there. And Taliesin Architects, which was Frank Lloyd Wright's firm, was retained to do the actual drawings. And I would, was fighting with them, and they would say, you know, these were all his accolades and students mm -hmm. from 20, 30, and 40 years earlier. He died in 59 when he signed the plans for this building. And we wanted to be recognized as, as a real Frank Lloyd Wright building, you know, not just somebody who was copying it. So we stayed true to the footprint and the exterior design. And we hired his firm and one of his people to design the furniture that had been with them. And Tony Putnam was the lead architect, who was Frank Lloyd Wright's student and gardener at one point in history, and, and Frank Lloyd Wright's daughter's boyfriend at one point. Uh, and they were our architectural firm, along with another firm in town that could actually design something to stand up, <laughs> an architectural slash engineering firm, because Taliesin wasn't known for its structural integrity. All their roofs leaked. Their buildings went, went to hell very quickly. And I remember one day with the lead architect, Tony Putnam, we're on a retreat 100 miles outside of Madison for two days. And we're on a retreat, and I came in with drawings, changing their drawings. Mm. And he said to me, and what I did, they had two, you entered into it, and then you walked around to the lake. And I wanted the building so that you could see through the building and see the lake 
from the Capitol two blocks away if you were at the right angle, mm. see right through it. And I separated everything and changed the relationship of all their spaces. And he said, everybody's trying to play architect. Now the manager's trying to play architect. And I looked at him and I said, if you guys would, we wouldn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and it wound up the way I, I had done it. And uh -huh. I, I designed most of the major elements. And then they made him look like something Frank Lloyd Wright would do. I put the center corridor to the mm -hmm. lake. Mm -hmm. Then they put a barrel vaulted ceiling into it. You know, so I put the spaces where I, the things where I wanted them to be. And then they made them look like Frank Lloyd Wright had designed mm -hmm. them. When we got done, we applied for certification from the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation as a Frank Lloyd Wright building. And I got a call from Brendan Gill, who was the architecture critic at the New York Times. And he said, why do you think you can call this a Frank Lloyd Wright building? I mean, I had, there had been a story interviewing me in the Times the week before. Mm -hmm. A local person in Madison who had won a Pulitzer at Newsday wrote a story about Winona Terrace and sold it to the Times. And, and I said, let's suppose we had built this building in 1938 when he first designed it, or in 1959 when he next designed it. And whatever we had built it as, it had outlived its usefulness. It no longer functioned as what we wanted. Let's say we had built it as a museum uh, or courthouse, and they needed a bigger jail and a bigger courthouse, and they built another one six blocks away. And we took this jail and courthouse and converted it into a performing arts center and museum, leaving the outside alone. Suppose we had done that. Would it still be a Frank Lloyd Wright building? And he said, yeah, that's been done in dozens of places. I said, well, why don't you just pretend that they did build it? <laughs> And now we gutted the inside and turned it into something else because the footprint and the exterior yeah. is exactly what he designed in 1938. And so he accepted <laughs> it. Uh, I was ready for him though. Mm -hmm. This wasn't an accident. Yeah. This did, I didn't come up with this. I was ready for the yeah. argument because yeah. all kinds of people say, well, it can't be a Frank Lloyd Wright building mm -hmm. if he's dead. Well, you know, it looks, if you look at the outside, it looks just like his sketches. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. it, it was great fun. But, and I was getting ready to leave Madison. Mm -hmm. I had done what I came for. I was running an old theater yeah. that was not special, uh, and it didn't have a big enough stage house to do the Phantom of the Operas of the mm -hmm. world, uh, and it was time to move on. I got summoned to the office of one of our benefactors on the other building, and well, he called me on a Friday afternoon at 4.30, and he said, can you be up here in the next 15 minutes? This was a guy who owned a printing company in town, and his wife owned American Girl Dolls, uh, which apparently I had a little girl, but it was many years earlier. So, uh, I, and I didn't have any granddaughters at the time, mm -hmm. uh, but apparently every little girl in the world wanted one. So, uh, I said I can't. I'm on my way out to see a donor. Uh, afternoon, late afternoon tea at their house, elderly couple, and he said, "How about?" seven o'clock Monday morning. At seven o'clock Monday morning, he has an out, a downtown office in a bank building. Uh, about five minutes earlier, I'm in the parking garage and I get into the elevator. And in the elevator was the guy I, who was, I was Mr. In, I was the, the arts guy. I'm, uh, I was the interior guy for the convention center, mm -hmm. and he was the guy that took care of the construction permits, the demolition permits, uh, uh, the moving of a railroad that was in the way, the moving of a road, driving piles, and, and I was the guy who took care of the inside mm -hmm. and, and hiring the staff. And he was there, and he had just resigned as the, city, as the city's director of development. And a lawyer I knew, who was the lawyer for this guy and also the head of the Wisconsin Foundation from the, for the Arts, which I sat on the board. And the three of us are in the elevator going to Jerry's office. So I immediately knew, because we had done a feasibility study. And I presented it to about renovating and building, and I had presented it to him about two months earlier. And he said, so what am I supposed to do with this? He said, I'd like you to lead a campaign that raises $50 million, $15 million. Because I was just talking about renovating. I was not talking about building new buildings. So we sit down in his office. And I knew this was, I gave him an 82-page report and a two-page executive summary. 
and he asked me for a, a, a four-minute explanation. And I gave him a four-minute explanation. He said, I'll think about it. In the meantime, his wife sells his, her company to Mattel for close to a billion dollars, her doll company. I run into him on the street. This is a week before. He said, come to my office. I run him up on the street, and I said, have you thought about the proposal? And he said, there are things happening. I said, you mean the thing I read in the paper this morning about the company being sold? He said, yeah, about that. There are things happening. I'll get back to you. We're actually crossing the street in opposite directions. Uh, so when the call came, I, I had an idea. When I saw these other two people in the elevator, I knew. So we sat down, and he said, I'm prepared to write a check for $50 million. Now, I got a lot of lunch and mileage out of that for two or three years. Was his hearing bad when I said 15 million or was my diction bad? <laughs> he heard 50 million and I said 15. <laughs> yeah, what's the truth here? Was it his mistake or mine? No, I don't want any other fundraising. Well, we hadn't hired an architect at this point. So two weeks later, I run into his wife and she said, how are you coming and getting together a list of architects? And I said, the big ones aren't interested for that amount of money. And it's going to cost more. And I heard Jerry told somebody else, you can't hardly build a building like that for less than $75 million. And she said, just find out what it's going to cost. We're going to pay for it. It was her money that he was mm -hmm. giving away. Just find out what it's going to cost and we'll pay for it. Well, he said 50. A year later, we announced he doubled his gift in a press conference to 100. We already knew it was much, going to be much more than 100. But six weeks prior to opening, he announced that the final cost would be $205 million, all paid for by him and his wife. The actual cost was $278 million, all paid for, but he didn't want to go back and keep reannouncing it. And, you know, there's bad blood in the town when somebody gives away that much money and it's not for everybody's favorite cause. It's for the mm -hmm. arts, you know, it's not for mm -hmm. the, to build a new hospital mm -hmm. or a hospice or oh, a building for the university. And he decided that there were plenty of people that were perfectly willing to do that mm -hmm. and not enough people willing to take care of the arts. So his foundation, when he put his share of the money into it, was the Overture Foundation mm -hmm. to build the Overture Center, not mm -hmm. a center with his name on it. His name is on the wall inside where there's a phrase from him about he, he and his family's mm -hmm. five generation family's gift to the city of Madison and he signed it. But his name is mm -hmm. not, he, mm -hmm. he's not named, he's not on the letterhead. And, uh, and she was very instrumental in the design. She had incredible instincts. She built a, a company with a $1 million investment from her husband into a company that they took a billion dollars worth of profits out and then sold for a billion mm. and all of this was in 10 years wow uh, so i only had one boss to report to not him her mm. she made the money we flew back and forth to connecticut to the architect and her airplane mm. you know? and then they they hired me to help design an american girl theater in chicago uh, she was still, well, we, we had started that before we announced this. Mattel owned it when we finished it, but she, came, she became vice president, vice chairman of Mattel, and she stayed there for four years, and we built a theater in Chicago. Uh, but it was, that, that's an experience of a lifetime, and after you do, it's the largest performing arts center in the United States under one roof. It's 480,000 wow. square feet. Mm -hmm. And... The old one that we replaced was 62,000 square feet, to put in perspective. We have four performance spaces, three art galleries, two museums, and something that's essentially a historical museum mm -hmm. in the building. And we used existing buildings and built new, mm -hmm. and we acquired yeah. the whole block. Mm -hmm. George, the guy I partnered with, took care of the acquisition of all the land again. Uh -huh. And uh, he was a developer. Well, that was quite an impressive career you've had starting essentially early here. 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 Yeah. I mean, this is the first building that was mine to manage. Yeah. And the dean said in one of my evaluations, one of my earlier evaluations, he has a deep sense of property. I guess I treated this like it was mine. Mm -hmm. You know, I never really quite knew what he meant. Mm -hmm. and, and he supported me. He was, mm -hmm. he was my, my greatest supporter on campus, and Harry John was next. Uh -huh. I mean, they, they were equal. Uh, and what's interesting, what I said about Dean Marvel at the funeral was 
that he was picked to be the head of the College of Fine and Applied Arts. He was a music person from Eastman School of Music. He was a musician and a composer. And I said, he created a theater program. He tried to move dance into this college. Mm -hmm. He was a total arts guy. You know, uh, it, it, the theater program didn't grow out of the English department. It grew out of a musician saying there needs to be a theater program. And there ultimately needs to be a music theater program mm -hmm. because that's where the work is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's where right. the work is. There isn't a lot and, of jobs for Shakespeare. And, and, as we, and look what we saw last yeah, night. That's where the, the work is. the result of the vision that Marvel and mm -hmm. so, Jack Cogdill and other people put in play. Mm -hmm. It was a great four years. I'm, I'm going to repeat something else, too. Because I, I, the thing I wrote for your program yeah. mentioned the snow. And this is even in there. When I got here in September of 2000, 1970, it was very rainy September, and it rained virtually every day. And along about the third week of September, I said to my secretary, who was right out of high school, she was 18 years and three months old, and who, when I asked her if she'd ever traveled, she said, I've been to Buffalo once. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> okay. Uh, she lived on a farm with her parents. And I, I said to her, when does the rain stop? And she said, Oh, in about six weeks when the snow starts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if, I had, if I were to call the thing that I wrote for you anything other than what I called it, and, I, I, and then there was a night, yeah. I thought about it after I sent it off to you. And every bad novel ever written started out, it was a dark and stormy <laughs> right. night. I would have said it yeah. was a dark and stormy, but it wasn't always stormy. It was beautiful snow. Yeah. It, here it's clean snow. In the city, it gets dirty real fast. And I just, I fell in love with this town right away. And so I grew here. It was as good for me as I was for it. Uh -huh. Well, I'm so glad you came back for our 50th anniversary. Uh, you've been a mentor to me. <laughs> I've got to look up the meaning of the phrase I used at the dinner on Friday night that you had told me where all the dead bodies were buried. Well, well, well you know, somebody interviewing me on a radio program once in Madison, yeah, Madison, said to me when he introed it, my next guest is Bob D'Angelo, who knows where all the bodies are buried <laughs> in the city of Madison. So... In the break, I said, Stuart, if you use that phrase again, you're going to be one of those bodies. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be one of those bodies. You did use I that. wouldn't put it past But that's you. the last time I had heard that line yeah. is when he tried yeah. to introduce me uh -huh. as that. I don't know where that came from. It's probably been around yeah. for as long as people have been yeah. burying bodies. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there, there were no bodies here. There were no skeletons here. There were no bad, there were no yeah. bad guys here. There really weren't. There were people with tempers. As a matter of fact, I mentioned one of them, mm -hmm. Ted Frazier. Uh -huh. who, he and I found Bob Marvel sadly deceased. He had a temper, but he was a perfectionist. And they're entitled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're entitled. Mm -hmm. Artists are entitled. Uh, when managers start losing their temper, you've got a problem. Our job is to keep it calm and, 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 and have people pay attention or pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. You need to pay attention to performers. Mm -hmm. they, I can't remember what play is, attention must be paid, was a repeated line. Mm -hmm. To performers, attention must be paid. You, you, you need to listen mm -hmm. to them because if they fail, you fail. You know, you, you want them to have the best night ever mm -hmm. when they're in your hall. And we had a lot of best nights ever. Well, I suggest we go collect our wives and go out to dinner. Sounds and good. Continue the conversation so, sounds off good. camera. I, I had a wife when I came in. It's been a long time. <laughs> Thank you so. Thank you, and Thank I hope you, I see Bob. you again. Yeah. In in less than five years. Okay. <laughs> okay. Me too. Okay. Me too. Thank you, Ted.